In this video, we'll continue our study of the echelon form of a matrix. In the previous video, we learned how to check whether a matrix is in echelon form or reduced echelon form. If you'd like to watch that video now, you can click the link on the screen. We also learned that a matrix has a unique reduced echelon form, but as we'll see, a given matrix can be row equivalent to many different echelon forms. So in this video, we'll be focusing on using row reduction to obtain an echelon form or the unique reduced echelon form of a given matrix. Remember that echelon form is all about leading entries in a row. If we look at our first row, our leading entry doesn't occur until the second column. So that zero in the first row first column isn't really where we want it. We'd really like to have our leading entry in the first row be in the first column. And we could obtain that, we can make that happen by swapping rows. So if we swap rows one and two, we'll see that now the leading entry in the first row is that negative two, and that's where we want it. Notice that we had a choice here. We could have swapped rows one and three. If we had done that, then we would end up at the end of this process, we would end up with a different echelon form. So that's why we say that there's not uniqueness when we talk about the echelon form of a matrix. So here's our new matrix that we have. This entry, this leading entry in this first row, we call that a pivot. So these leading entries that are going to be forming this echelon formation, uh, we call those pivots. And any column that contains a pivot, we call that a pivot column. So this is just terminology that we use to describe the echelon form of our matrix. Now that first column needs to have zeros below that leading entry. That was one of our rules that we had for echelon form. So that two that we see in the third row first column needs to be a zero. And we can make that happen by using our replacement operation. We're going to replace row three by row three plus row one. The negative two in row one will cancel out with the two in row three. And so we get the matrix that you see there. So here's our new matrix. So the first column looks good. We've got our leading entry and we've got zeros below it. So what about the next row? Well, the next row needs a pivot and that pivot is going to be in the second column. And there's already a non-zero entry there so we don't have to do any swapping but we do need to do some replacing. So the 10 that you see below that pivot needs to be a zero. And we can make that happen by again using a replacement operation, replacing row three by row three plus negative 10 times row two. So we have to multiply row two by negative 10, add the result to row three, and that will cancel out the 10 that we see there. Again, remember we're not changing row two, row two looks the way we want it to stay, but we are changing row three. And so we get the matrix we see there. So here's our new matrix. All right, where's the next pivot gonna be? Well, it's not going to be in column three. Notice that each row can only have one pivot because the pivot is the leading entry in that row. So row one is done, row two is done in terms of the pivots in that row. What about row three? That row needs a pivot and it's, it can't be in column three because there's a zero there. So it must be in column four. So that's where our next pivot is. Now, the rule about pivots is that there has to be zeros in the column below it, but in that third pivot, doesn't have any entries in the matrix below it. It's in the last row of the matrix. So we don't have to do any work on that last pivot. So this matrix is in echelon form. And I recommend that you go back and check the three rules that we talked about for echelon form to make sure that you see that this matrix really is in echelon form. So here's the process that we're using. So we're gonna begin with the first non-zero column. This is a pivot column. It's always gonna be a pivot column and the pivot position is at the top. Now that pivot position might have a zero in it as we saw in the example we just did. So if necessary, you're gonna swap rows to get a non-zero entry in that pivot position. And then you're gonna use the replacement operation to create zeros in all the positions below that pivot. Once you've got that column set, you're gonna move on to the next pivot column and repeat that process. And keep doing that until you get your matrix in echelon form. So very often echelon form will be sufficient for our needs. But sometimes we'll want our matrix to be in reduced echelon form, and then the algorithm is slightly different. We're going to change step three a little bit, but let's go back to the beginning and walk through it again. Begin with the first non-zero column. That's always a pivot column, and the pivot position is at the top. If necessary, you're going to swap rows to get a non-zero entry into that pivot position. Now here's where it's different. Scale the row to make the pivot equal one. Remember that for reduced echelon form, all of our pivots must equal one. Then use the replacement row operation to get zeros above and below the pivot. Again, remember that's our additional rule for reduced echelon form. And then again, move on to the next pivot column and repeat that process. So let's look at an example. This time we're gonna get our matrix into reduced echelon form just to see how that works. So again, I've abbreviated the rules here, but hopefully you get the idea. 
So step one is to find the pivot position. Again, that's at the top of the first non-zero columns. So that's easy to find. If that position had a zero in it, like the previous example that we did, we would have to do some swapping. But two is not zero, so we don't have to do any swapping. So we can skip ahead to step three. We're going to scale that row to make the pivot one. That means we're going to divide that row by two. So if our current pivot position is a two, we want it to be a one. So we're going to make it turn into a one by dividing that row by two or multiplying it by a half if you like that. So there's the result of multiplying by a half. Now we need to get zeros above and below the pivot. Now there's nothing above our pivot, so we just need to get zeros below. We'll be using our replacement operation. We'll multiply row one by negative four and add that to row two. That results in this matrix. We'll also multiply row one by two and add that to row four. That results in this matrix. So again, if I'm going too fast for you, just pause the video, do that operation, and make sure that you're seeing the numbers that we're getting here. But column one is set. We've got our pivot, which is a one. We've got zeros above and below. So we're ready to move on to the next pivot column. But which column is our next pivot column? We know that each row has to have a pivot, as long as it's not a row of zeros. So where is that pivot going to be? Is it going to be where the negative 11 is? Well, again, think about our other rules for echelon form. Our pivots need to go down and to the right. So if we allow that negative 11 to be a pivot, where's the pivot in the next row going to be? Well, the pivot in the next row is going to be the negative one, and so the pivot's going to go back to the left. So remember that our pivots always need to go down and to the right. So in fact, that negative one and that six there are going to cause us to have a problem. So our next pivot is actually where that zero is. Now you might say, well, wait a second, pivots are supposed to be non-zero, and I, and I would agree with you, you're right. So step two is now necessary. We need to swap our rows to get a non-zero number into that position. So again, we have a choice. We could swap rows two and three, or we could swap rows two and four. Swapping rows two and four would give us some nasty arithmetic. If we're thinking ahead a little bit, if we swap row four and put a six in that position, we're then going to have to divide by six, which is going to give us some nasty fractions. So we're going to do ourselves a favor and swap rows two and three. That's going to make it a lot nicer. So that's the result of doing that swap. Now we're ready to scale and replace. We're going to scale that row, to turn that pivot into a one. Well, to take negative one and turn it into one, we're going to multiply by negative one. So that gives us this matrix. Now we need zeros above and below. So the first replacement operation we'll do is to multiply row two by negative three and add that to row one. Notice that that didn't affect the pivot in row one. So we altered row one, but we didn't change the fact that our first pivot is still a one and still in the first position. So that's really the process we want to follow. We want to go one column at a time so that as we go along, we're not affecting the previous columns. We also need to turn the 6 into a 0, so we're going to take row 2, multiply it by negative 6, and add that to row 4. And that's the result. So column 2 is set, we've got our pivot and zeros above and below, so we're ready to move on to the next column. Well, we can certainly see that our next column is going to be a pivot column. We can get a non-zero entry into the third row, third column. So that's our pivot position. That pivot position is not 0, so we don't need to swap. So we're going to skip ahead to step 3. We need to turn that negative 11 into positive 1, so we're going to divide that row by negative 11, and that results in this. Now we need to get zeros above and below that pivot, so we're going to take row 3, multiply it by negative 7, add that to row 1. Take row 3, multiply it by positive 1, in other words, leave it alone, and add that to row 2. And then finally, we need to take row 3 and multiply it by negative 17, and add that to row 4 and that results in this matrix. So we're ready to move on to the next pivot column. So where is the next pivot column? Well, we've only got one column left. Is that column a pivot column? Where would the pivot in that column be? It can't be in row one because there's already a pivot in row one. It can't be in row two because there's already a pivot in row two. It can't be in row three because there's already a pivot in row three. And it can't be in row four because row four is all zeros. So in fact, that last column is not a pivot column and we're done. And again, if you notice, that matrix really is in reduced echelon form. So this is the process that we want to use. It is time consuming. It's a lot of arithmetic. But that's the process by which we start from a matrix and end up in reduced echelon form. So in the next video, we're going to learn how to interpret these echelon forms and find out what are these echelon forms actually good for? How do they help us determine the solution set of a system of linear equations? If you'd like to watch that video or the previous video in this series, you can click on one of the two links below.